uh, my supervisors, Dr. Yasmin Arafa and uh, Professor Cornelia. So I would like to talk today about my PhD research, which focuses on um, medical image processing and classification, particularly on diabetic retinopathy classification using deep learning. So uh, the outline of my talk um, today, I will be um, uh, taking you through a brief overview on the topic and the disease. And then uh, my, the research aim of my, uh, of my PhD research, and then some uh, remarks, conclusions, from literature review uh, and afterwards a propo the proposed deep learning uh, model for this problem and um, as well as the results that we have got so far and finally the conclusions. Okay, so um, so first of all, I'm not sure if anyone is from a medical background, but I think it would be useful if I just uh, talk briefly about the disease itself. So diabetic, uh, as you know, uh, diabetes is like many other diseases. When it gets developed, it might, it will have some complications. One of these complications, it's called diabetic retinopathy. It's a condition that occurs in the uh, human eye, to be more precise on the uh, retina of the eye due to diabetes mellitus. And um, diabetic uh, retinopathy is a, is a very common um, eye disease in uh, diabetic patients worldwide and it happens uh, when the retina get damaged uh, because of some changes of the blood vessels uh, of the retina some fluid leakage uh, or swelling or bleeding or growing some uh, blood vessels uh, abnormal blood uh, vessels and if uh, the disease uh, left untreated or undiagnosed at an early stage that will cause uh, uh, it might cause blindness or loss of vision uh, if it's not treated uh, at an early stage. Statistically, according to the uh, World Health uh, Organization, the number of diabetic adults uh, uh, in 2014 was approximately 425 million worldwide. And almost all patients that have uh, type 1 uh, uh, diabetes mellitus are more than 60% of diabetic uh, patients with type 2 uh, will develop uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy within the first 20 years of the diagnosis of their diabetes mellitus. So as I mentioned, it might lead to blindness. So to prevent this, uh, the loss of vision for the diabetic patients uh, from occurring because of diabetic retinopathy, the best modality is to diagnose it at an early stages. Nowadays, there's a different techniques and uh, methods that ophthalmologists they use to analyze and diagnose uh, uh, the patients using fundus images that capture the uh, uh, retina of the eye, which requires the patient to uh, uh, do a regular screening uh, yearly or maybe several times uh, uh, per year. So, uh, uh, so, however, this like, so the, 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 the ophthalmologists, they will need to uh, look into this, capture the retina image and look into it and analyze it and diagnose if this, they have disease or they don't have it. And if they have it, what is the severity level uh, uh, of this, of the, the diabetic retinopathy? But the problem with this is uh, still we have some a problem, especially in the undeveloped countries. It is still labor expensive, uh, requires expert ophthalmologists to read the and analyze and diagnose the, the images. And also it takes time. So therefore, automated uh, image analysis of fundus images, uh, we would we can benefit from the machine learning, pow pow uh, the power of machine learning and AI uh, uh, techniques to automate this uh, process that can act as a decision support system uh, uh, for the ophthalmologist. It can act a uh, uh, support system for some early career ophthalmologist or non-expert, uh, maybe any one with medical uh, part that will, uh, will speed up the process. Um, here in this slide, uh, I would like um, to show you just quickly, this is a normal eye, a normal retina of an anatomical part of the uh, normal eye with a normal uh, healthy parts and the, in the top one and the uh, bottom one is, is a diabetic retinopathy uh, uh, fundus uh, photograph. Uh, it, as, as you can see, there are some uh, spots like red spots here and um, yellow spots and some other uh, signs and lesions, those are like blood leakage, and those things when they develop, they will uh, lead to uh, blindness. Um, so let's come to the uh, our part, the machine learning 
or AI part. So in my PhD research, the major aim of the proposed research is to contribute towards improving the uh, diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy by implementing a, a deep learning model uh, for early detection uh, and classification of diabetic retinopathy that it is more possibly more accurate than the existing published work. Uh, since this, like this uh, area of research has been uh, very active in the recent years, so after conducting um, uh, a comprehensive literature review, uh, here are some um, uh, few remarks I would like to conclude. So most of the studies in the field of diabetic retinopathy, uh, uh, the field of detection and the classification, they use a small data set and they report a very good uh, performance measurements results. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it has a very motivating and uh, potential applications. But the problem with them, when you test it on another data sets, sometimes or many of the times they don't, uh, they have like they uh, report, a, like they give you a, a poor performance uh, because of the, the model is not well trained on a different uh, 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 formats of, uh, of different kinds of images that are taken from different cameras, uh, different ethnicities, different uh, qualities. So, uh, so that's why a larger data set uh, taken from different cameras and from different uh, machines uh, and uh, it has different uh, ethnicities uh, will. The, the, the issue is that we want to, want to address the problem as all, not only on this, uh, to be biased to this small data set. Another thing is more, uh, many papers or work has focused only on a particular diabetic retinopathy sign. One of those signs, for example, the red one or the yellow one, I showed you the hemorrhages and the exudates. Uh, uh, and this is a condition support system, it helps in diagnosing, but it's still not very comprehensive for diagnosing and uh, uh, analyzing the images. Uh, so we need a more comprehensive system. Uh, one more thing is uh, one of the challenges of uh, the fundus images. The fundus image is the image that taken from the machine of for the retina uh, is that the fundus images uh, 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 that its most parts of the retina images are irrelevant to the diabetic retinopathy to the disease while some other parts of the uh, input image have more um, let's say influences on the final label of an image so the problem here uh, comes that most of the convolutional neural network that approaches that they are proposed and employed for uh, DR classification, it process the input data without considering this fact. So to address this problem in our uh, my research, um, we have proposed uh, 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 to use something called multi-scale multi uh, attention network uh, uh, to classify the diabetic retinopathy images uh, that, can, uh, that has a multi-scale attention mechanism to uh, encode more local information from uh, the representation of the image. So I here um, I want to uh, here is uh, as you can see is um, the proposed uh, deep learning model in our research. It it consists of different layers like any other model. So obviously the first uh, first thing we uh, feed feed the uh, uh, the pre-processed image uh, the first and the first uh, part here into an encoder uh, to represent it in a different levels. Uh, in our um, um, uh, model here, we have used the encoder, the ResNet, as an encoder. So it generates, uh, as you can see here, the layers: uh, a low level, mid mid, mid level, and uh, high level uh, uh, representations. In most of the uh, uh, research and many of the research and also the baseline models, just connect the high level representation with the um, with the dense layer or the fully connected layer to generate the final output. In our case here, we have added uh, uh, a different um, uh, more layers and uh, more steps that uh, improve the performance of the model, which is uh, first thing is we combine uh, all the uh, low level, high level, and mid level representation together. We scale them and put them together to, to, to generate a multi-level representation as shown here in the semantic learning to uh, uh, generate the multi-level representation. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we use the idea of uh, uh, atlas convolution. The atlas convolution is, um, uh, um, 
it, it applies convolutional filters with different um, uh, uh, fields of view sizes. Uh, and that will help the network to, uh, let's say, uh, localize or encode more uh, local information, demanding a local information. So after uh, applying the uh, address on top of the multi-level representation, uh, the address convolution will generate information with different scales. And those uh, scales can be combined to generate a multi-scale representation. So we have get rid of we had we use the multi-level representation first from the encoder, and then we use the multi-scale representation, and then we use the idea of the attention mechanism by creating an attention map, which is a, a kind of a, a series of convolution layers uh, applied uh, to the the multi-scale uh, representation that we had here. So if we if we apply the attention to attention mechanism to uh, generate attention map and then multiply it once we multiply it with multi uh, uh, scale representation with this representation it will scale the representation again and give us the importance of the representation so it will give importance to each representation to generate the final scaled representation and after this step we can. Uh, as any typical uh, uh, neural network, we connect it with a fully, uh, or uh, we do uh, apply the global um, uh, average pooling, and then the, uh, and also the dense uh, connected with the, the fully connected layer to generate the final output here. In our case, the main objective, uh, of, uh, the objective of the model is to classify or categorize the images into uh, uh, classes based on the severity level of the eye. Uh, or the, so if it doesn't have the empathy, it's healthy image, or if it's not, and if it's not, what are the classes? So we've got five classes from represented. I will come to this now, but it's from zero to four uh, classes. But we have also trained the model uh, to uh, discriminate between the healthy and unhealthy images as an auxiliary task, but to make the final decision for out of the five classes. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much I wanted to say about the architecture. So in um, uh, the results, uh, for our final results here, the experimental results, uh, first, the data set that we have used, they are two public open access uh, data sets. Uh, it's called IPAX and Aptos. They are large data set, and uh, act, you can access it from uh, Kaggle. Uh, uh, the first one, IPAX, contains around 333,500 uh, retina images, and the aptus consists of a total of 3,600, around 600 uh, retina images. The image you can you see in this slide, uh, it has a, it is actually a sample of retina images for different classes. So every class here, every image, represents a different class based on the severity level. So for the model, zero represent un, uh, a healthy image, no diabetic empathy. One is a mild, two is a moderate, uh, severe, and so on. So there are five uh, uh, classes. Uh, so the results, um, I'm not sure of the time, I've got time. So yeah, so the results, uh, I'll go uh, through the results quickly. So as I mentioned, I have uh, we have created the the, uh, we experimented the model on multi classes and binary classification for the same data sets. Uh, we used a settings that other published paper uh, uh, they have already used the same data sets, and the 10% uh, of the data is testing, and the rest is uh, remainder is, is training. Um, so, uh, as you can see, the, 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 the result outperformed the state of the art for the recent, very recent papers on these data sets with uh, 84. Uh, more than 84 ac uh, accuracy and 91 sensitivity and specificity. And on the right side is the confusion matrix, is a, a, an accuracy for each uh, uh, class. Again, this is the binary, if it's healthy or unhealthy. Also, it, it, it performed really well, the model, also comparing to the baseline models. The other uh, literature uh, or papers, they have not reported the binary classification, so they are not included here. For the other data set, uh, uh, there is also recent, there's a recent paper, they have used a different uh, approach. Uh, we use the same setting, they have used the same uh, data set uh, and settings, uh, but with, with our method, uh, it also outperformed in terms of the Kappa score, and uh, they have not reported also accuracy and other performance measurements. Uh, 
Uh, here is also the confusion matrix for every uh, class. Same thing for the binary. It's uh, it it has uh, it's actually uh, uh, showing a really um, I think it's it's a good performance uh, and it is uh, could be like a great clinical I think it's a good clinical uh, it has a potential clinical application in the futures if it's applied as a whole addition support system. And one final thing in our. Um, one uh, final thing in our uh, evaluation was an ablation study, which is we removed some components uh, uh, of the model, the, of the developed model, to check how effective those components, which is I mentioned in my um, architecture, uh, which is the multi-level and multi-scale representations. So you can see the difference in the accuracy with and with for both data sets. There is a, 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 like a good uh, difference, improvement after using these um, uh, uh, approaches and also for the Kappa score so then so also the Kappa score is very important to check that uh, the, the model doesn't have a uh, biasness uh, in terms because like for example the Aptos data they are very imbalanced data in terms of the classes the one class has like maybe 50 percent of the data set uh, so the Kappa score is is very uh, effective or uh, important to check the re reliability on this model. Here is an example of uh, how it looks like the attention uh, map, which actually the attention uh, mechanism, it helps the model to focus on uh, on a, an the damaged areas uh, to encode more local information to make the final decision and what is the areas that are affecting it. So as you can see for different classes, um, this is for class zero and this is for class, um, the moderate one, class three. Um, I think this is, um, yeah, in my, in the conclusion, um, as I, it, it is just the contribution that we have used the multi-level feature encoding structure, um, also the multi-scale attention mechanism, the performance has been improved by the, using the multitask learning, using the auxiliary task uh, uh, in parallel with the multi-learning, uh, multi-class learning training so the also the binary classification training was helpful for the binary decisions and uh, uh, the the model has achieved like a, a good performance comparing to the, uh, the literature review on two public data sets which which coming from a different image from different machines and from different countries and uh, different equalities and uh, sizes uh, I think this is a pretty much uh, everything I wanted to um, say, uh, but if you are interested to know, obviously if you have any questions, you can post it. And uh, if you are interested to know more, this work has been published uh, in the IEEE Access, it's an open access uh, journal as well. Um, uh, it's recently has been published in March. And um, yeah, that's everything I want to say. Thank you very much for your attention indeed. So thank you very much for your talk. Uh, could you maybe say a little bit um, about the importance of open access source and so on for your work? Maybe I have yeah. missed the piece, but I think it's sounded very important. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, uh, obviously, uh, you, the, the especially the medical data set is very, very difficult to uh, have to, to get this data set from uh, anyone to do to test your model and evaluate it. Um, uh, without the open access data set that I found on Kaggle, I wouldn't be able to uh, to evaluate my model effectively and check how reliable it is because of diff several data sets they are open access there. Uh, and it, it, the process of getting um, a data set from private uh, places is very expensive and it's, 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 it's very diff like a long process, uh, especially for the medical uh, parts. So yeah, I, I, I would say like it, it's the main. It's very it's it's a core thing in my in my PhD is the open access for the data sets particularly.